Good morning, everybody. My name is Thorsten Hertler from ETH Zurich, and it's a big honor for me to present this keynote at the High Performance Interconnects Forum at HPC China this year. Um, I want to thank uh, the uh, chair of this uh, of this session, Jiao Yi Lu from Ohio State University, for inviting me. And it's a, a big honor to be talking or to be introducing that forum where so many esteemed industry uh, colleagues from Huawei, Alibaba, uh, as well as Mellanox are going to present there latest and greatest work on high performance interconnects. So let me get to my slides. I'm giving this uh, talk from, um, from the wonderful Zurich. I would love to be in China and uh, enjoy the local food, but unfortunately, given the situation, uh, I won't be able to, to join. I won't even be able to get into the country. But let me, let me start right away. Um, the point of my talk is actually, I, I want to convince you that now it's time for general in-network processing. So, but let me first start with a bit of history of the development of high performance computing interfaces or networking interfaces um, over the last couple of decades. As we all know, in the 1980s, uh, Ethernet, which is still alive, uh, was one of the most important networking technologies or most prevalent networking technologies that together with TCP IP started building the internet and had a huge impact on society as a whole. In the high performance computing area, networks were quickly specialized uh, to coherent network access, uh, for example, with SCI, uh, coherent memory access, for example, with SCI and other uh, interconnects. But those were relatively quickly also replaced by messaging based or active messaging based interfaces, for example, through fast messages and later uh, Murinet Glens messages and uh, Murinet MX that also enabled operating system bypass. And now we are coming in the early 2000s, where Quadrix was a network that allowed full protocol offload and was way ahead of its time and unfortunately not uh, too successful in, in, in practice, but it, it developed many of the techniques we are actually using today. And then it was quickly followed by the virtual infra, uh, interface architecture, uh, so-called VIA, that enabled zero copy at a larger scale and with a larger um, number of, of different adopters, for example, Cray Gemini and later also InfiniBand took up the principles of VIA and, and also the principles developed in Quadrix. And namely the IB verbs interface is the most important interface in this area. And that led to the early remote direct memory access networks. That is when my career uh, started when I joined um, the, uh, the club of high performance networking uh, researchers, basically together with InfiniBand uh, in the early or mid 2000s. So then later the Open Fabrics Alliance started um, their, uh, their, their business of trying to standardize this whole development a little bit more and trying to have inter-vendor um, well, alliances to, to make this more broadly applicable, especially the programming. Portals 4 was one very interesting network interface that developed triggered operations. So you could now actually offload uh, so-called triggers to the network card that upon reception of a specific message, of a matchable message, would launch new messages or even operations um, on the incoming data. And then Libfabric was uh, taking the key principles of portals and moved forward. But what are now the principles that we should put into a smart NIC? Because from here, from the 1980s to today, NICs were relatively quickly developing into quite complex devices. And today, today we have mostly smart NICs that we claim have some kind of brain even inside them. So what are the principles of smart NICs, of smart NIC hardware? And what are the principles of uh, smart NIC theory, so to say? Um, let me a little bit elaborate what's the state of smart NICs today. So today we have, so we have uh, network cards that have full ARM cores on them. Uh, with actually running full operating system instances. For example, Bluefield or, or Broadcom's, uh, Mellanox's Bluefield or Broadcom's devices, you can buy and they, they can run a full operating system for extremely convenient programming. But unfortunately, all of those um, are somewhat outside the packet pipelining. So it's relatively expensive to access packets from within that uh, core that, that are coming, going through the chip. Um, then, if we move into the packet processing pipeline on these network cards, we have so-called flow processors that have very limited flexibility, for example, P4, but that can uh, operate at an extremely high bandwidth, like the Netronome and Barefoot um, devices. And then we have a third category of um, network cards or smart NICs that are enabling fully reconfigurable hardware. For example, the Microsoft Catapult, Xilinx, or Intel um, FPGA-based system that have somewhat limited productivity and uh, limited silicon efficiency, but they are of course much more flexible than uh, building a specialized NIC for a special purpose. 
And they're of course um, programmable, but slightly less programmable than the full operating system on, on course. But now the question is, what is next? What are we going to do next in this area? So what are the principles and what are the actual implementations that we are going for? So let me quickly summarize the state of the art from a slightly different perspective, from a performance perspective. So we have data processing in modern RDMA networks where we have remote nodes that send packets. So these packets arrive at uh, an RDMA NIC today. So these are network cards that we have today. These NICs that perform simple RDMA processing, which is basically just looking up an address um, to deposit the memory to in main memory, uh, the, to deposit the packet into main memory in the, at the host. And then of course the host has to read the packet and process it um, in its main CPU and then uh, continue with whatever the packet was going to do. So, but what is now uh, the performance principle here? Or what is the performance of these devices? So on Mellanox Connect X5 devices today, we have about one packet coming in every five nanoseconds in the, in the worst case. But tomorrow with 400G cards, we may have one packet about every one nanosecond coming in. And this is incredibly um, hard to process if you look at this um, relatively slowish for packet processing or relatively inefficient networking stack that we have on today's, um, on today's course because we deposit the message into the, the uh, network buffer, but then we still need to uh, perform processing, load it through the whole cache hierarchy into the registers of the CPU to eventually perform uh, the processing in the registers of the CPU. If we wouldn't process the message, we wouldn't need to receive it. Um, so the question is now, can the CPU, or is the CPU an, an, an efficient way to process all these packets, or should we invest into other ways to process these packets and maybe merge it into the working set or into the working data at the main CPU more efficiently. And there the question is, can we use the RDMA NIC for such uh, a task? And the intuition here is that the RDMA NIC is a specialized device and that specialized device is really specialized to data movement. And now why don't we take that specialization and move it a little bit further just towards um, not just towards data movement, but actually towards simple data processing. So I'm not talking about much processing in the sense of solving LinPack on your device, but very simple processing. So just changing fields and merging data into the right location in main memory. This is something an RDMA NIC could do at line rate with one packet arriving every 1.2 nanoseconds without much trouble. Um, so talking about acceleration, that's probably ringing a bell uh, for you. We have a lot of acceleration going on in the compute area. So acceleration in the sense that we moved from specialized graphic devices, OpenGL and uh, DirectX 11 were the programming interfaces for those graphic devices, so graphic cards, we, through a process of generalization that somewhat revolutionized acceleration, I would say, to CUDA-based or OpenCL or OpenMP4-based acceler compute-accelerated devices. So these devices are changing the landscape of computing as we speak right now. They also lead to excessive um, use in the um, deep learning acceleration area. So CUDA has made a huge impact there. In fact, some people claim that the deep learning revolution that we are observing right now was enabled by the available compute um, through CUDA mainly. And why don't we do the same with network acceleration? But unfortunately, the state of current network acceleration with P4 and eBPF and these specialized protocols is very much the same as we had for graphics acceleration. So very specialized to the task at hand. Here we had shader languages that were just able to express and whatever you needed to express in order to generate computer graphics. And then through generalization, we, we, limited, uh, we lifted it to more general purpose languages. Here in P4 and eBPF, we now have languages that are optimized for packet processing. And now we want to lift those languages through generalization to have general data acceleration principles. And we call our proposal that is kind of the CUDA for networking, we call it SPIN, streaming processing in the network. And we based on RISC -V, uh, on the Risk Five hardware architecture for our current prototype implementations. So what we want to do, or what I want to convince you today, that we want to move from this very specialized processing in P4 and eBPF for packet processing to a very generic packet processing model that we could support in a model such as uh, Spin on a Risk V architecture. But the key is really that we have fully programmable packet handlers. So these packet handlers in our model, you can write in C or C++, and you can run arbitrary functions, very much like you can run arbitrary functions on a graphics device that was optimized for graphics initially, but now you program it with CUDA and run deep learning and all kinds of different workloads on these graphics devices. We want to go into this direction with the networking, in the networking area, but make sure of course, that we don't compete with the uh, CUDA implementations, we optimize this all for the data movement. So this is kind of the main message of my talk. Um, 
So let me quickly get you a little, a little bit more details of what I actually want to, uh, want to get at. So this is an architecture of a network interface card. So what we call a spin NIC, spin network interface card. So network interface card has, of course, a, a, a um, serial interface where um, packets are coming in or leaving uh, the NIC. And then the inbound engine, in our case, is linked to some kind of matching unit. And the matching unit does nothing but decide whether that packet should go right into host memory, so no processing is necessary, or whether that specific packet that just came in is processed through our NIC compute engine. So if it's processed through our NIC compute engine, then we can apply all these handlers that I was talk talking about, really general purpose uh, processing. So we have the inbound engine, the matching unit that has uh, various matching entries, and then we decide whether we want to go to that NIC or we don't want to go to that NIC. So then once we are chosen, we have chosen a packet for uh, processing in the matching engine, and then this packet will go through our abstract machine model. And this is now the programmer's view of the spin network. So we have here a fast shared packet memory, we have a packet scheduler, and we have various uh, handler processing units, in this case four. And of course we have a DMA unit to communicate with the main memory at the host. What does the CPU now do in that whole model? The CPU doesn't do a whole lot, but it does two things very similar to the CPU's role in, in the CUDA environment. It uploads handlers. In CUDA, these handlers are called kernels, but since we are dealing with packets, we are invoking handlers on every single packet, and it manages the memory on the NIC, very similar to the CUDA memory management mode. So if we now have packets coming into this model or into this abstract machine, these packets first move into the shared memory, then they move uh, towards the handler processing units where they are processed in parallel. And then they move through the DMA unit into main memory. And of course, they can be, their shape can change in an arbitrary way to be integrated into the computation that is happening on the CPU or at the main host. So now let me illustrate you a little bit more how that works in a fully integrated system. So here we have the main memory and the CPU of the source, the network card of the source, the network card at the destination, and the main memory and CPU at the destination. So with RDMA, if we have a packet, that packet travels from the, uh, from the CPU to the network card, then to the remote network card, and then into the CPU's memory, and then back. So if we now have the same with spin, what we could do, for example, in a simple ping, ping pong benchmark, the packet would still originate at the source, it would still go to this target CPU, uh, to the target NIC, but then the target NIC could immediately reply with a pong packet back to the initiator. So this sounds pretty simple. We save a little bit of latency going to the main memory, but it's, it can be pretty significant in practice. The major, um, major benefit comes from pipelining multiple packets. As we can see here with RDMA, all of these packets have to first commit to main memory at the destination here. And only then the destination can reply after the full message has been received to the source for all kinds of uh, reasons such as reliability in the network, for example. But with spin, what we can do, we can process each packet separately on the NIC and we can reply with the, those packets even before the full message has been received. So this pipelining is quite efficient for achieving an overall uh, very quick network and, and much higher bandwidth. But now how does spin look like from a programming interface perspective? So we, we model packets or sets of packets as messages. So something very much, um, uh, very much motivated by remote memory access, so RDMA accesses or um, messages in the sense of message passing messages. It's, it's slightly different for stream-based uh, models such as TCP, but you can also make spin work in a stream-based model. But let me focus here on messages. So a message consists of a header packet, the first packet, then multiple payload packets, and a final packet, which we call the tail or the last packet. So then these packets, the header packet, is going through the packet scheduler and the header handler, a specialized piece of code that the programmer uploads, like the C, the C code here, is executed on that header packet. Then all of these um, payload packets are, again, executed in the spin unit with a payload handler. Here, it's very important to understand that these payload packets are not um, bound by any uh, order. So they can be processed in fully in parallel, like we've seen in the previous animation. And then at the end, we invoke a completion handler. Basically, after all packets have been completed, have been processed, we invoke a user-defined completion handler. So what does this mean? The header handler could, for example, set up a data structure like the source ID here. Uh, the payload handler can now ping, this is actually the real ping pong code that I, just, that I just showed, can now use that setup state that is initialized by the header handler to ping each packet back to the source. And the comp completion handler then basically cleans up all the state. So now what you can do is you can link these handler, handlers, the uh, header handler, payload handler, and the completion handler 
to a, a specific connection such that the NIC can then execute those in the, in the fast pipeline. So these handlers, this code, will be compiled for the target architecture and downloaded into the network card. So now I gave you a motivation and the remaining uh, two thirds of the talk, I want to spend on a, a deep example on data layout transformation, a hardware implementation that we have, uh, that we're developing right now that will be open source very quickly. And then if we have time, cover some further use cases for the spin programming model. So a very uh, simple application that is very prevalent in high performance computing is coming from uh, the parallelization of, um, of parallel codes. So if, we, if this is the application domain, for example, a weather or climate simulation in a 3D domain, and we split it into uh, four different pieces, this basically means that we have these four tensors or four arrays um, now separated. And if you have a nearest neighbor communication, we are going to, uh, to communicate between the boundaries of these processes here, of these um, uh, subsets, subdomains. And now, of course, this communication is not always consecutive in memory. So we may need to pull elements that are away by a certain stride, like we can see here. We need to communicate all the blue elements out of this big um, piece of memory, and there are some gaps in between. So what do we need to do? Well, we either need to copy all of these elements in a consecutive memory, or we instruct the NIC to send all of these, uh, all of these elements uh, separately. So this is what we call a structured exchange. Um, it, is, it is very well supported in MPI, as we'll see in a couple of minutes. But this is even more powerful, this principle, because what we could also do, we could reshape data while we send data in a certain form. We will receive it in another form. Uh, quite impressive results have been shown for fast Fourier transform where we can achieve a speed up of nearly 2x. Um, and then it gets even uh, more flexible if we support unstructured exchanges. So we can, like in a particle code that doesn't have a structured model, we can pull arbitrary data elements out of the, um, out of the domain and then send them in arbitrary form. So all of this is supported by MPI data types. And all of this is actually supported by our implementation of MPI data types. But let me go a little bit further and uh, give you now an overview of how we could su uh, support these non-contiguous transfers in various programming models. For example, RMC, Shmem, CAF, UPC, Chapel. Basically every high performance distributed memory programming model has some form of supporting this extremely important um, um, pattern, communication pattern for data access. And they have various ways to do this. So IO vectors, strided accesses, or strided transfer, compiler assisted aggregation, and so on. But what we want to focus on is the most comprehensive and also most complex of those, that is MPI derived data types, because they support everything that I mentioned in the previous slide, while these models very often only support specific subsets. So again, what is an MPI data type? We want to send a subset of a memory region here in blue, and then we can define the subset of a memory region through some kind of structured um, nested definition. So for example, we can say, well, these first six blue elements, they form a so-called vector data types, and these remaining four blue elements, they form an index data type. Together, we can combine them into a struct. So each MPI-derived data type forms a tree of these uh, subtypes that eventually will be a basic type, like these blue elements are basic types. So how does that work today if we process these? Well, we have the source CPU, we have a piece of data that is then moving through the NIC into the input buffer at the destination memory. This is what MPI-CH uh, or MVAPH do today in the common case. Then this is loaded from, from this input buffer to the CPU, and then the CPU copies the data into destination memory. Of course, this is wasteful because we now load the data twice from memory. So first we load and write the data twice from into memory. So we first write it to memory, then we read it into the CPU, and then we write it again. So this gives you, for this particular example, where we are varying the block size of these data types. Here we have a fixed, a fixed size, and we are varying the block size here from, um, from one block to two blocks to four blocks. Right? So this is the x-axis from four bytes to 16 kilobytes. Uh, the total size is a four megabyte message. So we are varying the, range, the number of regions from 1,000 regions to 256 um, non-contiguous regions. So this is the performance we see, and it's much, much below the line rate of about 200 gigabit per second that we are assuming. Um, can we now offload this data type processing and how fast can we get? And now we come to our implementation where we really run this in handlers in the network card um, with the packet processing. So first what we do is we just support the simple vector data type where we have in this particular example, we have six uh, elements to move. We have three blocks, each of them is of size two, so six elements total, and they have a stride of three 
in between them. And the basic type is an integer in this particular example. For this, we write a handler that I just discussed before in C++ or, or in C, what, whatever you prefer. And we load this definition as well as the handler into the NIC memory used uh, by the CPU. And then each packet coming in is now going to be processed by this handler. And here's the actual handler code. It's, it's, it's not much. Usually these handlers have on the order of tens uh, to at most uh, several hundreds of instructions. So they have to be very small because if you process this at 200G line rate, then you cannot afford very much processing, but they are extremely powerful with these very little instructions. So the first part loads the data type information. The second part computes the destination addresses. And the third part actually implements the splitting of the packet and the DMA into the correct uh, regions into the main memory at the CPU. So that's what's happening. So it's relatively simple, but of course, uh, and as we can see, it gives you a very high performance. So beginning from a block size of 64, we essentially saturate line rate. What we see here, the gap between line rate and, and uh, what we achieve with the vectorized copy is basically protocol overheads, um, header overheads that are unavoidable in the networking, uh, in, in this networking example. So of course, now it gets more complicated. What if we have types that are not just simple vectors, but if they're vectors and indexed and structs combined in trees, as I mentioned before, then we would need to rewrite this in a relatively complex manner, which we don't necessarily want to do to generate all the C code, either manually or automatically. So we basically take a completely different approach to even show that this is more powerful than I'm just presenting. So the idea is now that we take an existing library for processing MPI data types, that it has been written and designed for CPU processing and move it into the network card. And this is the so-called MPI types library written by uh, Robert Ross and, and Bill Gropp and colleagues at Argonne um, in, uh, more than 10 years ago, but it's still used in MPI CH and most of the MPI implementations today. So this library actually models the, uh, the, the, the basic data types here, these two vectors as so-called data loops in a hierarchical tree-shaped manner, as you can see. So we are combining an index and a vector data type uh, that, that is now live or specifying um, a data layout in host memory. And then we load this all into NIC memory, and then we execute um, one after the other. Like, of course, we are, we are first stepping when we receive the packets or the, ele the elements through the vector, and then we are, once we have filled the first vector, we have to move to the index type and then we fill the second vector. So this can be relatively complex um, if we have very complex data types that don't have two nestings, uh, just have two, two nestings. And I don't want to go too much into detail, but our implementation takes advantage of all kinds of uh, uh, tricks, but eventually uses that, reuses that source code of that library that exists in C and just runs it on the NIC. So the idea here, the main idea that we have is that we split the logical um, logical byte offsets of, of the full message into what we call virtual HPUs. So HPU zero is the first part of the message. HPU one is the second part, as you can see here with the, ve with the vector. HPU two is the third part. HPU three is the fourth, the fifth, and the second. And we make sure that even if there are multiple messages belonging to the same part, they are going to the same virtual HPU. So this is some kind of scheduling trick. And then the first two messages go to HPU zero, as I mentioned, the next two messages to HP, virtual HPU one, and this can be mapped to arbitrary physical HPUs. So this is the main trick we employ in this particular work, and it works relatively well. The only challenge that we have left is we have to um, carefully select the checkpoint interval. So what is a checkpoint? A checkpoint is now a boundary between those two virtual HPUs. So the checkpoint size, is somehow the size of, or, or, or the, the checkpoint span, I would more call it, not the size, is somehow the, uh, the, the number of packets or the number of bytes that is covered by these uh, virtual H, each of the virtual HPUs. By the way, we have also evaluated several other schemes that are not as efficient that I don't have time to talk about, but if, you, um, if you're interested in those, you can read this paper down here or watch the talk uh, by my student, which is also on YouTube. But what we basically achieve with this to take the main result up front is that here we see the specialized implementation, which reaches line rate at 64 packets. And then the RW checkpoints is what our virtual HPU model is. And we see it nearly reaches the same performance. So basically at 256 bytes, we are indistinguishably close or within the noise uh, to the line rate and the specialized implementation. So, and, but this as opposed to the specialized one now supports arbitrary MPI data types. This is quite uh, an, an achievement in my um, 
and my student's achievement, not my achievement, in, in my opinion. So now if we select the checkpoint, in, or the question is how do, we, how do we select the checkpoint interval? So how many packets do we process per virtual HPU? And now if you look at this animation, there comes a network packet, it goes to virtual HPU zero, there comes a second network packet, which now has to be buffered because virtual HPU zero, or actually physical HPU zero, is still busy processing the previous one. However, now that the second packet comes in, this second packet, if it belongs to a different um, virtual HPU or, or a different checkpoint, then it can be immediately be processed by, in parallel by another HPU. And then of course the first one eventually finishes and can process the first packet. And so now we have a relatively complex pipeline. We, we need to buffer the second incoming packet as well and so on. And now the question is, what is the optimal size? So how many of these incoming packets do we want to process by the same HPU and when do we want to switch to the next HPU? The obvious trade-off is that the, the more checkpoints we have, the more memory we occupy and the more uh, context switches we have. And um, the less checkpoints we have, the more buffering we have to do. So this is something uh, that is an interesting trade-off. We can formalize this in this uh, not so complicated, but also too long to explain in this uh, overview talk equation, but we can solve it now. And the trade-off is really, as I mentioned, we want to limit the impact of scheduling overheads, which is also a cost. We do not want to have too much memory occupancy. And we, of course, do not want to saturate uh, the packet buffer with this buffering of these packets be before we can actually process them. So with that, I would uh, close that uh, first example, but now get a little bit more into the actual implementation. So we actually implemented all of this in a simulation, but also in real hardware RTL code with the help of our colleagues um, at the electrical engineering department under Luca Benini. Um, but first, let me talk about the the simulation where we have is the Craze uh, slingshot simulator, which is based on SST. So a very similar uh, model as the, the network uh, that, that is driving many of the exascale or planned exascale computers in the United States. And then um, we combine this with the GEM5 simulation on the actual, um, on, on an actual ARM class CPU. And we will later get to the RISC-V CPU. So, we get uh, several results for real application data types, and I just want to summarize them quickly. So we get huge speed ups um, for our RW, our best method for the arbitrary data type offload. And then uh, the, the specialized method is slightly faster, um, but again, it's much higher effort to implement the specialized method. And we compare this to a normal IOVEC, um, which in this case is emulating portals 4, but it would be very similar to run this uh, if you would run this over InfiniBand or over any uh, standard network. So you can see here that in this particular example, for example, um, we have a speed up of more than 10x over the um, e existing approach, right? And then I don't want to go into too much detail. There's a lot of good data um, that we could all uh, present here, um, but I would like you to, to, I would like to refer you to this paper if you care about details. Um, very interesting uh, insight is also that just after reusing a data type four times, 75% of the data types um, already amortize the initialization overhead. Because we, of course, we need to set up that specific channel um, for processing that I didn't really talk about, but you can imagine, like if you un uh, offload a kernel, uh, a CUDA kernel to a GPU, it takes some overhead. If you offload a networking kernel to the spin interface, it of course also takes some overhead. Um, and then we have several other results that, that we, can, we could talk about. Uh, but again, I want, to, uh, I want to accelerate a little bit here because I'm slowly <laughs> getting towards the two thirds of my talk and I don't want to keep you too busy uh, too, too long. So now let, it, let me move to the actual hardware implementation. So our P-SPIN implementation is an implementation of SPIN on the parallel ultra low power uh, processor that also, that's also developed in, uh, at ETH Zurich and as I mentioned, Luca Benini's group. So how does this work? It's very similar to what I showed at the beginning. So we have a network interface, we have an inbound engine, we have the P-SPIN unit, which is now the real hardware implementation of the SPIN unit, and we have a host interface. Of course, there's some kind of command unit that, uh, that controls outbound engines, because this unit can, in fact, also issue new messages, so like portals triggered operations. So if you look at the P-SPIN unit itself, it has three different types of memory, uh, slower memory. So it has packet buffer, uh, program memory and handler memory, and then it has a, a hardware packet scheduler, and it has uh, four different scheduling clusters with uh, multiple cores each, in fact, with H cores each. Each of this cluster has a, a, a single cycle accessible shared memory, has a DMA, mem, uh, DMA engine, and a cluster scheduler. So this DMA engine can access the layer two packet buffer. It can also access 
um, the, the host interface um, through the other DMA. And the, the, uh, so of course can access the host interface through the uh, main DMA engine, sorry. Um, it also has a command unit and a monitoring and control unit. So this is all the hardware block that we implemented um, with the help of our colleagues in the PSPIN unit. So um, the, hardware, the hardware block is nice in the sense that it runs at about one gigahertz in the uh, Global Foundry's 22 nanometer process on the FDSOI. It has a, a very small number, or a relatively small number of gates. So it has only about 100 million gates. Uh, this is equivalent to about 19 square millimeters in, uh, in that particular process, um, assuming a layout density of 85%. And most of this, actually more than half, goes into the uh, layer two, uh, level two scratch pad memory. And even if you look at the four clusters here, you will still see nearly 80 or more than 80% goes into, of those clusters goes into a uh, level one scratch pad memory. So most of this unit is in fact memory. Um, we could still, or we are still exploring whether this memory can actually be shared with the packet input buffer and the output buffers of the, uh, of the NIC itself. Currently, this is duplicated memory and you would need to copy through those. In comparison to the Mellanox Bluefield adapter, which we estimate an area of about 51 square millimeters based on these cores and the process, um, we could have up to 64 cores um, in that same uh, area. And we will see about the, the performance very soon. Uh, where we have some benefits because we are running right in the NIC pipeline. Um, so then the power consumption is about six watts if we assume 100, so the upper limit to the power consumption, if we really assume 100% utilization of all the, um, all the transistors at every cycle. So the question is now, um, why do we want to have this design? And we try to make that point through a performance argument. We compare our architecture through a Zinc implementation, which is an uh, ARM uh, Cortex A53, a 64-bit CPU, so relatively beefy, beefy CPU, but, but not too um, beefy as an application class, but not the, the biggest one at 1.2 gigahertz, so somehow comparable frequency. We also compare it to an Intel Skylake Gold Edition, which is now a, a really fast uh, CPU, three gigahertz CPU. And uh, our unit, as I mentioned, is a 32-bit in order one gigahertz uh, um, uh, core. So very, very simple core as e even compared to the Zinc core. And the use cases uh, we have are, are numerous. Um, I just want to, I, I don't want to explain them in detail. I just want to show you some results. So here is the maximum throughput for two kilobyte packets for full processing of two kilobyte packets in terabits per second. The two lines I'm showing here in this diagram are 200 gigabit per second and 400 gigabit per second. And um, you can see these use cases. The red line is always the ARM implementation. The blue, uh, sorry, the green line is the x86 implementation, the fast Intel CPU. And the blue line is our PSPIN implementation. So you can now see that in many cases, the absolute performance of the x86 uh, and of the ARM CPU is actually higher, which is not surprising because this is a superscalar CPU and it, uh, it offers out of order execution and the very fast clock rate. So it's actually surprising that in some cases, uh, the, the spin unit is, is faster, but this is just due to the much faster memory we have. We have single cycle accessible memory in our course and extremely fast level two access, which is actually faster relatively seen to the performance than these other CPUs. But now if we look at the die area, it gets quite interesting. So here, uh, the, the x86 is the largest. So it's, it's about 18 square millimeter. Uh, that, that die uh, for a single core, and uh, this is per core. Um, and the zinc is about um, one square millimeter, and we are about 0.5 or a little bit more than, than 0.5. Um, and if we scale this to the process, we, we see uh, to the same process technology, we see that we have about um, a factor of three to the zinc and, and a factor of, um, it's more like, um, yeah, a large factor to the, to the x86 CPU. And now if we actually normalize our throughput by area, by chip area, then we really see the power of spin. So then x86 is always uh, relatively inefficient because it has these large caches which um, our workload cannot really benefit from. But the, um, uh, the, the, the Zinc, the ARM-based implementation is more efficient than x86, but in pretty much every case, spin largely outperforms um, the other implementations in terms of performance per area. And then we can also look at the development of throughput. So we, uh, for if the packets get large enough, so here are the different histogram um, bars illustrate different packet sizes, 64 byte, 512 byte, and one kilobyte. Here, this was all for two kilobyte packets. Um, 
then we will see that we relatively quickly, beginning from uh, 512 kilobytes, sometimes even smaller, we reach the processing at full 200 gigabit line rate. Uh, what was our requirement? We also reach or exceed processing at 400G line rate. Um, so let me now come to another use case um, after finishing that data type use case, hopefully convincing you that this general purpose programming is not a bad idea on Nix, and it'll just become better and better and better as we move forward. So I now want to give you some more use cases that you can uh, ponder whether you could take advantage of that particular uh, uh, technology. So the, the next use case is network group communication. And the idea here is that we want to uh, implement a broadcast. Here we have eight different nodes, and again, the same symbols. We have the CPUs and the memory and the network card. And the broadcast performs an operation where we launch a packet at, the, at, at one CPU, and it has to be distributed to all CPUs. So if we do it with the standard RDMA, what we do is we employ a tree-like algorithm where we first send the packet to one neighbor, then these two uh, processes that have the pa received the packet send it to uh, two neighbors, and then these four processes that have the message send it to uh, four other CPUs. Now, if we see all the packets go through the NIC through main memory into the target CPU. And this is the simulated performance that we achieve. If you now do this in a portals four triggered operation uh, model where we can actually trigger messages right from the NIC, the idea is that we deposit the message into main memory at the destination, but then send it right from that memory at the destination to the next, um, to the next uh, well, receiver. And now, this is, of course, uh, slightly faster because we don't have to involve the CPU at the target, but it's not so much faster because the, uh, the distance between memory and the CPU is usually small. The big distance is between the NIC and the main memory. And this is what we are saving uh, with the spin interface, where we are really offloading the network uh, or the packets into the network card, and the network card then asynchronously sends those directly to the destination network cards without involving the memory or the CPU at the host. Of course, eventually it'll have to deposit these received packets into the memory, but still the forwarding is much, much faster. And the actual handler itself is only 24 mm -hmm. instruction and a set of puts. So this is uh, very, very fast. Um, then we have a, a whole flurry of additional use cases. So for example, we have um, a use case where we could offload the full MPI protocol. So the uh, MPI rendezvous protocol, and we could gain an application speed up um, up to 60% here um, for, these particular, um, um, for these particular simulation results. So the rendezvous protocol is basically the protocol where sender and receiver are agreeing to transmit a certain large message across the network that cannot be buffered at the destination. So it's an MPI specific protocol. But in the data center, we could actually implement a distributed key value store where we could implement the full key value store with spin in the networking card. Our simulations show that we can uh, gain about 41% uh, of the latency back that you would have in a CPU-based implementation of a key value store. We could also implement a conditional read where we conditionally read data at the, at the destination, for example, for database implementations where we have uh, filtering. And we could also implement uh, distributed transactions, again, fully in the network card where we um, run, um, yeah, well, we run the full transaction in the network card and uh, perform packet logging and, and all of these, or, or content logging and all of these functionalities. We could also implement a fault tolerant broadcast where the NIC itself will replicate these messages to uh, many other NICs that would then be able to recover from errors in the network. Or even more powerful than fault tolerant broadcast, we could implement a full distributed consensus protocol where the NICs could implement their own consensus and then commit, uh, consistently commit their results into the main memory. So, but that's <laughs> it's not even all. The next 700 use cases, I would say, or even more, would be uh, the implementation of graph kernels or acceler network acceleration for very um, irregular workloads. So, for example, the new class of sparse neural networks could benefit from this, or um, just more traditional graph uh, graph based computation. So, think about that, and you will find lots of use cases where data movement is actually dominating. Um, the network transmission time and the spin network uh, acceleration model could actually help in that particular case. So now the next question is, what next? So now we have this implemented on the NIC. We're uh, coming to a conclusion on that project. This will be open source. You can, you can use it. You can uh, build your own NICs. Um, and we have some industry collaborations about building such spin NICs. So it's going to be very exciting. But now, can we push this idea into the network? This needs to be carefully vetted. 
because we ha already have these packet processing ideas like P4 in the network that I mentioned before. I still believe that we can actually benefit from full processing in the network. It's going to be more complex than on the NIC. However, it is uh, certainly an opportunity that we are investigating right now. Um, before moving or before pushing us into the network, I want to give you a little bit of background what the problems in the network are. These are slightly different from the NIC because the network itself has effects such as congestion and, and uh, contention at the endpoint where you may have issues. Um, one of the not so obvious issues is actually network noise. So this is something, this is slightly unrelated um, to, to um, network offload, but it's an extremely important topic one needs to understand in order to do uh, careful networking, especially large scale application on network offload, um, not, not, not offload, large scale application on the network uh, research. So this is why I want to briefly outline a, a, another work that uh, one of my postdocs has led. Um, this is really mitigating the network noise on Dragonfly or low diameter networks, we could say in general, through application aware routing. So this is a very interesting trick because the network is causing network noise. So what, is, what does network noise mean? So network noise is really the fact that if you send a message, you will not see a deterministic performance. You can have network acceleration as you want, like NIC acceleration. You will still not see deterministic performance because you're sharing network resources, specifically links and, switch, uh, and buffers and switches with other applications that you don't have under control. Okay, so this is one of the major problems. This is what we call network noise. So when I send a message, I'm just hoping that the resources in the network will be available for me during that network transmission. And they may not be fully available and then my message is going to be delayed. And this delay is what we call network noise. It turns out that this delay is incredibly, um, uh, incredibly disturbing on low diameter networks with adaptive routing. So this is what we found experimentally on a large scale supercomputer in Switzerland, the Pitstein machine uh, used to be the fastest computer in Europe uh, until, until this year and uh, has about 5,000 nodes connected with the Cray um, areas network. And the interesting observation was that due to the adaptive routing and that low diameter dragonfly topology, network noise was growing um, very high. And this is why we designed a new solution um, where we could actually control the path selection. So the adaptivity of the network, um, network path selection at the endpoint and adjust it to the application requirements. So here, basically before we send a message, we monitor the state of the network and then we estimate the best possible path at the application. So this is not adaptive packet level routing in the network, but we do this very slowly or relatively slowly at the application, still before each message sent. And we find that we can improve uh, performance on, of up to 55% on real applications. So if you are suffering from network noise, or if you think you're suffering from network noise, or at least application variability, then you should look at this work and you should uh, try if that can help you as well. Currently, the op open source implementation is available uh, for Cray systems. And then there's an interesting development on the Cray side, uh, the next generation interconnect, that is the follow-up of the areas interconnect, the so so-called slingshot exascale interconnect, is, um, has additional hardware features to um, limit this, uh, this, this interference or network noise. And we have a very detailed analysis, which you can uh, find here, or which will appear at uh, Supercomputing 2020 in November, but you can find the paper on archive already, um, where we show that compared to the, the older areas network, actually the impact of network noise or um, in general, cross application contention and congestion is nearly negligible. So they have mechanisms in the network that I don't have time to go into, but you will find them uh, partially described in that, uh, in that paper that I'm citing here um, that can mitigate that crosstalk across different applications. So it's a very, very impressive uh, work. Um, came right after we solved the problem at the application level, but of course it's a much better solution at the network level where it's uh, implemented on a per packet basis. So I also want to remind you that in my lab in, in Switzerland, uh, we are hiring. So if you feel like you're a qualified PhD student or postdoc, um, please uh, let us know. And with that, I would like to conclude my talk and in the last minute I have, quickly summarize again what I have talked about. So I strongly believe that the time is ripe today for a fully generic network packet uh, processing offloading into the NIC and tomorrow into the network. So I showed the spin NIC streaming processing in the network abstract machine model. I showed you the programming interface, which is inspired by CUDA and uh, very much works the same way and various application results that actually should convince you that we can achieve high performance. I also showed you a hardware implementation of that same 
um, of that same principle in, a, in an open source RISC-V based uh, processor together with uh, Luca Benini's group at ETH Zurich based on the, uh, on the pulp framework. So you find the full specification of SPIN here in this, uh, this archive paper that is linked at the bottom of this page, or you can also go to our webpage and try it out and uh, download it and run it yourself, print your own NICs, or even run it on FPGA. Thank you very much. And now I'm open for questions that you can send by email or uh, through the session chair. Thank you.